Good afternoon and welcome to the Fennec and Fennec Malta Shipping Update. I am Martina Faruja, an associate at the Fennec and, Fe at Fennec and Fennec Advocates, and I will be your host for this webinar. Thank you for joining us, and we're very excited to be hosting you. Today's webinar will include five speakers who will represent the different areas of our shipping practice. So this webinar will hopefully have something for everyone. I will start by giving a brief run through of the program. Our first speaker will be Anne Fennec, our managing partner and head of the Marine Litigation Department at Fennec and Fennec Advocates, who will be discussing the challenges faced by ship owners when saving lives at sea in the Mediterranean. Anne will be followed by Lara Saguna Asha, who is a director of Fennec and Fennec Marine Services and senior associate at Fennec and Fennec Advocates in the Ship Registration Department. Laura will be talking about the measures taken by the Ship Registry in Malta to overcome the challenges posed by posed by COVID-19. Next, we will have Alison Vassallo, a partner and head of the yachting department at the firm who will be speaking about the recent developments in the yachting sector in Malta. This is literally hot off the press, so I've no doubt that the people listening in are eagerly awaiting the latest news. After Alison, we will have Peter Grima, an associate in the ship finance department, who will be giving us some insight into the latest developments in ship finance in recent months. Our final speaker will be Adrian Attard, a partner within the Marine Litigation Department at the firm who will be discussing the effects of COVID-19 on dispute resolution in Malta. The format is going to be in the form of five 10-minute presentations with the last 10 minutes focused on answering questions. I know that we've received a number of questions through the registration form, so thank you very much for that. But if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to submit them using the question and answer box found at the bottom of your screens, and we'll do our best to address them also. If we don't manage to address all your questions in time, we'll be sure to get in, in touch with you after the webinar by email. So just a small note, the webinar will be recorded and will be available on demand within a few days time. So without further ado, I would like to now invite Anne to take the virtual stage and say a few words. Anne. Thank you, Martina. And on behalf of Fennec and Fennec, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar this afternoon. Um, at Fennec and Fennec, we, we really feel privileged that we have an extremely extensive shipping law practice, which touches on every aspect of the maritime sector and maritime life as it is represented in Malta. And as we know, Malta is truly a maritime hub where anything and everything related to shipping actually takes place. From transshipment to ship repair, to salvage, to pilotage, to yachting, to absolutely everything you can possibly think of. So normally what we do every couple of years is actually have a seminar where we can share our experiences with our colleagues and our guests. But unfortunately this year that was not to be because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we decided to transpose our seminar onto the virtual platform and have a webinar. Of course, you know, there isn't much you can say in an hour, but we will try to cover as much as possible. So thank you so very much for joining us. And if you need anything from any of us after the webinar, all you need to do is get into our website, get our email addresses, and just let us know how we can help you. Thank you very much indeed. Great. Okay. Thank you, Anne. We're going to begin our webinar with our first presentation. So we'll have Anne Fennec, Managing Partner and Head of the Marine Litigation Department, who will be discussing the challenges faced by ship owners when saving lives at sea in the Mediterranean. Anne. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Yes, I mean, I've been practicing now for 34 years and 29 of those from Malta. And as I've just said, we're very privileged because we get exposed to every possible circumstance you can think of. However, um, over the past few years, particularly over the past couple of months, actually, um, we have noted that we have been increasingly involved in um, actually assisting ship owners when faced with a particular situation in the Mediterranean. And that is when they find themselves having to um, give assistance and save life at sea in the Mediterranean. Now, of course, shipping has its own risks. Every ship, every, every carrier carrying crew, carrying passengers or cargo will have its risks. There are the risks of weather, there are the risks of casualty, the ports, the crew. Shipping is intrinsically a risky business, but not many ship owners actually find themselves in a situation where they actually have to 
answer calls of distress and go and give assistance to lives, to persons in danger of losing their life. And when they do, they do that, these ship owners, these masters, these crew respond. Of course they respond. However, this is something that is happening with a degree of frequency in the Mediterranean. And it is happening with a degree of frequency in the Mediterranean, because in the Mediterranean, we're seeing a human tragedy. This is a human tragedy of incredible proportions, where hundreds of thousands of people are displaced because of the torture, because of the violence, because of the ravages of war in their countries, predominantly from sub-Saharan Africa, Syria and Bangladesh. They leave their homes, they leave and they go to Libya because they perceive Libya as being the closest place to get them to Europe. So they arrive in Libya and as soon as they arrive in Libya, they're pounced upon by people traffickers. These are unscrupulous people who couldn't care less about them and are only interested in extorting them for every penny they have. And they promise them heaven on earth. So they put them in these rickety dinghies in order to make their way 500 miles across the Mediterranean to what they perceive to be a better life. And of course, the reality of the situation is that they're in these dinghies, hundreds of them, in one dinghy with barely any food or water. A number of them make it, a number of them drown, a number of them die of dehydration. A number of them manage to get SOS calls. And those SOS calls are picked up by the regional um, coordination centers, maritime coordination, rescue coordination centers. And when the regional coordination centers pick up these distress calls, they then look at the um, MED, they identify the closest vessel, they ring and connect, connect with the closest vessel, and those vessels invariably and immediately go to save lives at sea. Because saving life at sea is a sacrosanct duty, but not only is it a sacrosanct legal obligation, it is a moral duty. And I know of no seafarer who would ever pass on that moral obligation to save life at sea. So they go and they save life at sea. They deviate from the contractual route and save life at sea. But what we are, happy, what we are seeing now, and this is really the problem that I'm going to be speaking about, is that they are then left to their own devices. And after having fulfilled their obligation and saved life at sea, they are receiving no instructions as to, dis as to the disembarkation of these passengers. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is actually what happened only on the 3rd of May last month with a ship called the Maria. The Maria was a container vessel, a tiny Klingenberg container ship, which was chartered to CMA CGM. She was en route from Sfax to Malta, carrying containers where she was going to discharge containers and load containers for a return journey to Sousse. At two o'clock in the morning on the 3rd of May, they get a call, an emergency distress call from Malta RCC, telling the master to deviate from the contractual route and to go and give um, assistance to persons in distress. Please bear in mind that this was back in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. So without so much as thinking about the exposure that the crew are going to have in this situation, the master, like any morally bound, dutiful seafarer, um, moves off from the contractual route, deviates from the contractual route, goes to the location where they find 79 migrants. And please bear in mind there are 13 crew members. The location was about 20 miles south of Lampedusa. They bring these people on board. These are traumatized migrants who have spent days at sea, they are dehydrated, they are scared, they are terrified. They are brought on board by the 13 crew members and after um, seeing to their immediate needs, the master of course calls back Malta RCC and asks Malta RCC uh, and informs Malta RCC that he is going to go back to Malta en route because of course he was destined to go there to discharge the containers. Malta RCC says, no, please stand by for further instructions. Do not move from there. The day passes, calls Malta RCC again. Malta RCC says, I'm sorry, but we have no further instructions for the time being. On seeing this, the master immediately contacted Lampedusa RCC and Lampedusa RCC says, no, you don't come anywhere near us. And of course, Lampedusa was the closest port because by now they're about 16 miles, 20 miles south of Lampedusa. 
And what happens after the 2nd of May, ladies and gentlemen, is a devastating, traumatic, stressful experience lasting for five days, where 13 members of crew have to take care of 79 very, very delicate migrants who are traumatized. Naturally, there is no food enough on board to last for five days to feed 79 people, because that is not what the galley on the ship or a small container ship is geared for. They were receiving bottled water, but all fresh water supplies run out. Every day there is more and more of a stressful situation. Till there was a point where um, knife fights start to develop between migrants who are getting more and more stressed out at the situation. So that results with the crew being locked in their own accommodation area and only going out to feed the members, the, these, these migrants. And in the meantime, the master, the owners, us as lawyers, we were engaged the day after. We are continuously um, negotiating and trying to figure out what is going to happen and where they are going to be disembarked. As far as I am concerned, and as far as the owners were concerned, and as far as the club is concerned, whether they were disembarked in Malta or whether they were disembarked in Italy was irrelevant. The most important thing is that they be disembarked. Malta RCC took the view that they needed to be disembarked in Italy because Italy was its closest port. Italy, on the other hand, took the view that these people were rescued in the Malta search and rescue area and consequently ought to be taken to Malta. So what was the position at law? Well, the position at law starts off with the 1979 Search and Rescue Convention. And the 1979 Search and Rescue Convention provides for the setup for states to um, patrol and to organize their resources for search and rescue in the area. The, there was an amendment to the 1979 Convention, and the amendment to the 79 Convention was the 1998 Amendment. And in the 1998 Amendment, we have the definition of rescue, and the definition of rescue, I'm trying desperately to find it here, runs as follows. An operation to retrieve persons in distress, provide for their initial medical or other needs, and deliver them to a place of safety. Now, place of safety has traditionally been um, defined as being a place, the closest safe port to which a vessel can take these migrants. And of course, the closest port was Italy. However, after the 1998 convention, with Italy and Spain seeing the brunt of uh, migrant arrivals, they figured that if, the, if this was going to continue to be the interpretation, then they were going to see thousands, hundreds of thousands of migrants arrive in their shores. And consequently, they pushed for an amendment in 2004. And that amendment in 2004 ran as follows. Uh, it remained the primary obligation of the state in whose search and rescue area migrants are found to coordinate and rescue the disembarkation of the survivors and where disembarkation cannot be coordinated to the nearest safe port. Disembarkation has to be done within the territory of the coordinating state. So this, of course, changed things and it therefore became the responsibility of the state which was pur 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 purveying the um, uh, search and rescue operation to disembark in that state if there was no possible, no other possibility. Of course, that would have meant that all the migrants in the whole of the Maltese search and rescue area, which extends for 600 nautical miles across the Med, would have to be disembarked in Malta. And that was not acceptable to Malta. It was not acceptable to Malta because we are an island of something like 14 miles by eight, and it is inconceivable for all the migrants to be landed in Malta and disembarked in Malta, all those found in that search and rescue area. However, um, this is the situation we had here. So we had a standoff between Italy and Malta. And it was only on after, after an immense amount of pressure with the Maltese authorities, with the Italian authorities, that on the morning of the 8th of May, at a time when the some migrants actually threatened to jump overboard and commit suicide, that the master radioed to Lampedusa Port Control and said, if you don't let me in, I am going to issue a general distress signal. And it was that 
coupled with all the efforts that we were working on on a 24-7 basis, that finally the Italian authorities allowed the disembarkation of these people in um, Porto Empedocle in Sicily uh, after a five-day ordeal. In the meantime, of course, the crew are devastated, the crew are traumatized, the migrants are traumatized. The owner has had to interrupt his charter with enormous amounts of expense and effort. This is not right and this needs to be resolved. And I believe, and I will conclude, this is a problem which is becoming increasingly difficult to deal with and a real challenge for commercial shipping in the Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for that. Yes, this is a problem with very few easy answers. Um, our next speaker will be Laura Saguna Asha, who is a director of Fennec and Fennec Marine Services, who will be talking about the measures taken by the Malta Ship Registry in overcoming the challenges posed by COVID-19. Laura. Thank you, Martina. Um, so when, when, the, when things started developing, Transport Malta was probably one of the first authorities in Malta to start looking into the measures that needed to be taken, particularly since Malta is an international ship registry, so its ships are all over the globe. So even when things were still quite um, okay, so to say, in Malta, uh, its ships were already facing issues wherever they were across the globe. So on the one hand, Transport Malta wanted to see that it protects its staff, so um, the majority of them started working remotely from home, and also access to the public, as the general public, um, was no longer possible to carry out searches, have meetings, etc. But on the other hand, um, Transport Malta also needed to ensure that it would help as far as possible with the issues being faced by its ships uh, wherever they were. So one of the things that they did is, um, as some of you may be aware, certain documentation usually needs to be filed in original with the registry, such as the mortgage deed in the case of a mortgage registration and the bill of sale in the case of a transfer of ownership. Um, in the circumstances, Transport Malta started to accept scanned copies of the documents, provided that the originals are present here in Malta so that they can be filed as soon as it becomes possible to do so. Associated with this, there is also the issue of the right legalization of documents. Um, usually, um, certain documentation needs to be legalized to be acceptable to Transport Malta, but with several foreign ministries, foreign affairs offices being closed and also um, consul offices being um, unavailable, the registry is accepting um, documentation which is notarized without apostille, and in certain cases even the notarization is being temporarily uh, waived um, on condition, however, that the legalized documents can be provided as soon as it becomes possible to do so. Uh, Transport Malta, acknowledging the fact that owners are facing cash flow issues, also issued a notice advising that in the case of renewals of uh, certificates of business that's expiring um, after the first, from the 1st April onwards, uh, upon a request from the owner or the operator, Transport Malta will accept to renew the certificate um, but postpone the payment of the renewal fees as well as Spanish tax dues where applicable for a period of three months. So in such case, once a request is released, the renewal certificate is still released in time and renewal fees and punish tax fees need to be paid within that three month period. One of the major issues being faced by uh, owners and operators of ships relates to crew. As you are aware, the, pursuant to the Maritime Labour Convention, this um, crew members on board ships must be repatriated at the termination of the seafarer employment agreement. But with ships being unable to enter into ports, this of course became a big issue. So in line with what other registries are also doing and in agreement with all the parties concerned, including of course the crew member, uh, the seafarer employment agreement can be extended for a period of three months, which can be extended further until things settle down and repatriation can be arranged for at the earliest opportunity. Another issue relating to crew is the validity of their certificates. Of course, while they are on board, 
certain certificates are expiring, and these include the crew certification. So in these cases, where a certificate of competency has been issued by a foreign administration and Malta has also issued an enforcement certificate, Transport Malta is accepting um, upon a request being made that the endorsement is extended up to the validity period, the extended validity period of certificate of competency. Another issue being faced uh, by owners and operators and managers of ships is the issue of surveys, inspections, and audits, which should be carried out. Uh, with shipyards being closed and therefore dry docking not being possible in certain countries, and also surveyors being unable to board ships, Transport Malta is accepting upon a request made by a classification society that these um, uh, surveys, audits, and inspections are extended or postponed. It is important to point out that the request must come from a classification society. And the reason for this is that Transport Malta need to ensure that the request is a genuine one and not simply being made because the owners and operators didn't think ahead. So the Transport Malta will, before accepting to provide an extension, ensure, they will ensure that it's true, the ship is in a place where these surveys cannot be carried out. Um, in connection with this, in the case of commercial yachts, Transport Malta is currently also accepting that surveys are carried out remotely. So, as you can see, Transport Malta has, as far as possible, done its best to, where it can, be flexible and uh, issue measures um, which can assist um, these owners and, and operators to try as much as possible to keep things going. Uh, at the same time, of course, Transport Malta has always um, kept in mind that it needs to retain its level of service and standards, which at the end of the day has led it to where it is today with its reputation. Uh, we know as a fact that as from today, Transport Malta staff have now returned to working from the registry, from their offices. So we are expecting things to be gradually returning to normal and we are now waiting to see what new measures will be um, released by the registry. Thank you very much, Laura, for that detailed update. That was really interesting. Thank you. So our next speaker is Alison Vassallo, a partner and the head of the yachting department at the FEM, who will be discussing the recent developments in the yachting sector in Malta. Alison. Thank you, Martina. So as uh, Martina hinted in the introduction, today we have some uh, very fresh news to, to be able to communicate to the yachting industry, and uh, which is of course very good news. And uh, the context is that of course, ever since the start of the first cases um, of, of COVID patients in Malta, uh, the islands have been subject to the travel ban order, which has also now been extended to cover um, uh, all countries. So travel to and from a number of countries, which was published on the 23rd of March. So ever since then, it was not possible or it was possible for yachts to come to Malta under very restricted circumstances. Um, as an industry, we have been lobbying uh, very hard to obtain um, an exemption for yachts now that the situation in Malta has stabilized very, very um, admirably, I would say. And uh, just today, a, port, a, a notice has been published, a legal notice, uh, which provides an exemption from the travel ban order for yachts coming from all countries who would require to vet in Malta for the carrying out of customs procedures, refueling services, um, uh, and any ancillary technical requirement only with crew on board, so with no passengers, no guests. And this, of course, is welcomed with open arms by the industry because it is being introduced at a time where, as I said, the health situation in Malta is extremely stable and also at a time when we are now, as a yachting industry, at the beginning of the summer season where we are um, handling a significant number of inquiries and interest in yachts that wish to come to Malta to avail themselves of a number of customs procedures um, and also, of course, servicing requirements or repairs as and when necessary. 
So now we are at the point where, since this is very new, um, in fact, the, the notice, the order, the exemption order comes into force exactly today. We are waiting for further clarification from the court and the health authorities who we know are currently in discussions to finalize the guidelines to be communicated to the industry in order that uh, everyone would know exactly what needs to be done. However, in the meantime, the message is that yachts can start to submit um, requests for arrival into Malta, that um, the usual requirements uh, prescribed under the port regulations, such as the submission of a maritime health declaration by the, port, by the captain to the port authorities, the appointment of an agent, uh, and uh, the requirement of compliance with any quarantine measures that will, will be imposed need to be abided by. But uh, we can really start to set the wheel in motion to assist owners to make their plans for arrival. So that is very good news indeed, and I am very, very delighted to be able to share that with you today. The timing couldn't have been better, to be honest. So as regards now with life proceeding back to a vestige of normality and us getting on with our work, uh, we can go back to look at the various procedures that uh, are available. And uh, incidentally, before uh, this, this uh, very unexpected situation hit us in March, uh, we had, as a firm, communicated that a number of developments, in fact, in the beginning of March, uh, had taken place with regard to commercial yacht importations, which is something that tends to keep us very busy in June and July, because yachts would usually either be coming um, from the Caribbean to start their summer season um, in the Mediterranean, or there would be a number of deliveries of new vessels from yachts outside the, the EU, or that have been outside the EU, um, who wish to come uh, to Europe to be able to be put on the chart. And June and July are usually the, the peak months. So uh, it would be of interest to clients, to owners, and to their um, advisors to be aware that the commercial yacht procedures, which have already proved to be very attractive over the years, are now even um, smoother, so to say, are, are better and are more improved. And by that I mean that if some of you recall, in the past, if an owner wished to import a yacht in Malta, there was the requirement of the setting up of a bank guarantee on the basis of which VAT on importation would be deferred for it, therefore, to be accounted for in Malta, and the bank guarantee would expire over a period of four months. Now, with regard to the new developments, if the importing entity is a Maltese entity that has um, a VAT registration in Malta and is importing IOT through into the European Union through Malta, then the requirement for the setting up of a bank guarantee has been removed. So, of course, this is a very attractive proposition to clients that are looking to Malta as a one-stop shop, so to say, in setting up an owning entity in Malta, um, setting up um, of their flag registration, their tax compliance um, measures in Malta, to really and effectively have a smoother procedure, which is less bureaucratic. With regard to yachts that are not owned by Maltese entity, and of course we do have situations where for a number of reasons, the owner um, would wish to have a, a, an entity that is registered outside of Malta as the owning entity, then the bank guarantee has been reduced with regard to amount uh, to be a percentage of the value of the yacht, which is 0.75% of the value, as opposed to 20% um, of the value that we had in the past. So again, that is now um, something which is uh, rendering the, the entire package of, of uh, yachting um, procedures more attractive. So we are very pleased as well now to be able to start applying it in practice because we had all these measures in place, COVID hit us, so we had to sort of take a step back, but now we can start to set the, the wheel in motion again. Um, I'm just checking my time, but I think we have 
uh, enough time also to cover the recent developments, again, beginning of the year, relating to the famous um, VAT leasing structure, which I'm sure most of you um, are aware of with regard to yachts. In fact, a specific question was put to us by Richard Philippe, who um, we, we say hi to from here, um, who wanted to have an update on what is happening. And it's a, it's a very legitimate question because we heard so much about that in the beginning of the year. So as uh, most of you know, the VAT leasing structure um, which had been operative in Malta for over 10 years, had been um, stopped by the Maltese authorities further to a uh, number of communications made by the European Commission. And it was halted more than a year ago now and replaced by new guidelines, which reflect the discussions that took place between the Maltese authorities and the European Commission. Again, the industry was very heavily involved in the, in the setting up of these guidelines during the past months. And the revised guidelines were published and updated on the 12th of March, again, exactly before um, all the travel ban orders were starting to be introduced. And the revised guidelines essentially make it clear what VAT um, calculations would apply to the leasing of pleasure yachts. And essentially, the guidelines clarify that the principle of use and enjoyment of yachts will be applied with respect to the time that a yacht spends in European waters as opposed to the time that it spends outside European waters. Bottom line is that if a yacht is being leased to a lessee under an operating lease, then the lessee would pay VAT on the lease of the yacht, on the hire, for the time that the yacht spends in European waters and would not pay VAT on the portion of the lease relating to the time where the yacht is being used outside European waters. And that, of course, um, clarifies the application of this principle to all um, uh, operators and, and owners who would be interested in setting up an operating lease that is subject to Maltese law. And uh, again, the, the new development is that now it would be important for the captain to maintain a log of the time that the yacht is spending within European waters and outside European waters, because there has to be actual evidence of this, of this period. So we are very much looking forward to start to apply these, uh, these guidelines. In the meantime, of course, clients are always free to um, approach us for a clarification of the manner in which these particular setups can be applied um, on a particular yacht, and I would encourage that if there is interest in, in this option to, to get in touch with us because then we can have a discussion on what would make sense even as regards calculations and, and the technical side of the, of the operation. But I, I think my time is up now, so um, I will of course have time for any questions at the end, and uh, thank you. Back to Martina. Thank, Thank you. you, Alison. I think you've made a few of our guests very happy hearing that things are indeed finally moving forward. So our next speaker is Associate Peter Grima, who works in the Ship Finance Department, who will be giving us some insight into the latest developments in ship finance in recent months. Peter. One moment, Peter, I think you are muted. Sorry about that, everyone. Thank you, Hi. Thank you again, Martina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, what I would like to basically run through with you all today are the recent trends which we have seen developing in the ship finance industry. Um, some of those trends have been a direct result of the COVID pandemic and the impact that that has had on the trade, international trade. And also I would like to discuss the trends that have been developing over the last couple of years are therefore not a result of the COVID pandemic, but uh, rather have continued to develop in spite of. So with respect to the recent developments that we've seen in the ship finance industry, I would like to focus on the cruise line industry in particular. And the reason for this is because cruise line vessels, as you are aware, are some of the most expensive vessels on the market and the cruise line industry 
has been one of the worst impacted sectors of our industry because they've seen most of their vessels having to be laid up over the course of the last couple of months. And what we've been seeing in the cruise line industry is an increased appetite uh, for lenders and borrowers to enter into negotiations to amortize their loans in what they're called debt holidays. Now, these debt holidays give rise to a refining, uh, refinancing scenario in our case, in our experience as legal counsel in Malta, because um, these debt holidays essentially require as consideration that the borrowers pay a premium to the lenders as a consideration for the bank agreeing to allow them to um, not make their monthly repayments over the course of the next year or so. Now, under Morty's law, there are two instances in which we would need to enter into fresh security. And these instances are one where there are either um, new obligations being secured by an existing mortgage, or where there are um, additional amounts being secured by that mortgage. In the circumstances we have been involved in, we have seen both an increase in the amount being secured and an additional obligation being secured. So we have been engaged to uh, re basically register fresh security. Um, now, maybe at this point, I should actually also uh, mention that before actually engaging local council to start uh, working on fresh security documents that would be registered with the registry in Malta, one step that uh, borrowers need to actually uh, go through is checking their loan facility because what we find is that sometimes actually trying to reschedule your loan repayments would constitute an event of default. So borrowers are encouraged to actually first look at their loan facility, see what the events of default clause state, and then they will be in a position to understand whether they are actually uh, capable of negotiating these debt holidays without triggering an event of default. Naturally, of course, the, the instances that we have been involved in uh, did not have these, these particular provisions included, and so we were, we were free to act and advise. Um, now, moving on to another aspect of the ship finance industry, uh, I would like to uh, touch upon something that has been developing over the last couple of years now, and which notwithstanding COVID has continued to be of interest to uh, borrowers as an, in their efforts to obtain financing. And here I'm talking about the alternative financing mechanism, which is known as the sale and lease back. Now, the sale and lease back mechanism grew uh, out of the 2008 um, meltdown, as you are well aware, and it was very popular in Malta. We have seen it grow over the years as banks, traditional lenders, have uh, looked to offset their loans, looked to divest their portfolios and sell off their loans to try and reduce their risk exposure to the ship finance, to the ship, to shipping industry. And uh, what has, this has led to an increase in what is, has been called um, the sale and lease back. Now, the sale and lease back that we have been predominantly exposed to in Malta has been uh, with one which involves the Chinese leasing houses. The Chinese leasing houses um, would typically um, take ownership of vessels that were ordered by the operator and they would then lease back the vessel to the operator who effectively gains full operation of the vessel subject obviously to the responsibility of paying for insurances, maintaining the vessel in a good condition. And um, we find that this this mechanism has thrived in Malta because we have regulated it in terms of Morty's law. We had introduced legal notice 210 into Morty's law a couple of years ago and basically uh, regulated the interests of both the lessor and the lessee in this bare boat charter arrangement. And the effect that that has had is that the lessee is basically given the right to have the certificates issued in its name and gain full operation of the vessel subject to paying the charter hire. And the lessee, the lessor being the, the leasing house, would still maintain title to the vessel. The title would be registered with the registry in Malta, 
And on an event of default, the default being failure to pay the charter hire, it would be able to immediately take possession of the vessel by simply filing a notice of default. It would be generally be an electronic, uh, by electronic means to the lessee and informing the registrar and Malta that he will be revoking his consent to have the certificates issued in the name of the lessee. Now, we have, of course, witnessed a reduction in, in ship finance or across the board. However, we have seen a reduction in ship financing transactions when it comes to new builds. When it comes to refinancing, we've actually seen an increase across the board. We've seen an increase when it comes to debt holidays. We've seen an increase when it comes to sale and leasebacks. And the reason why the sale and leaseback has been so attractive also and will continue to be attractive is because it has the purpose of the, the facility. It facilitates the, the means of freeing up capital, right? So when you are an owner of a vessel in the current climate that we're living in, the, the main problem is capital. Cash flow is, is the problem. So a sale and leaseback in a refinancing scenario allows the lessee to sell its vessel to a leasing house. The leasing house will lease it back. It gains, it frees up capital, which can then invest into its company. And uh, it still maintains operation of the vessel. So to conclude, um, we will anticipate to see more uh, debt holidays. We have seen many in the past couple of months. We are involved in quite a few at the moment, and we will continue to see more as the months uh, wear on. How the ship finance industry will continue to adapt and evolve over the next couple of months will largely depend on how soon we can get back to normal operations. So these are maybe questions that we will better be in a better position to address come end of the third quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter. However, what is certain is that we have seen an increase in refinancing and we will continue to see an increase in refinancing over the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It will be interesting to see how things develop over the, over the coming months. That's right. So our last but certainly not least speaker is Adrian Attard, a partner at the firm who will be discussing the effects of COVID-19 on dispute resolution in Malta. Adrian. Thank you, Martina. Um, when we were planning this seminar uh, about a month ago, I thought it would be a splendid idea to discuss how uh, COVID restrictions in Malta were affecting litigious claims and the filing of judicial acts. Back in March, uh, the Maltese government had issued two legal notices, number 61 and 65, by means of which they effectively ordered our courts to close and suspended all peremptory periods and um, time bars. Over the last couple of months, we have been inundated with queries from clients, both foreign and legal and international, asking us, where does that leave them? What's the situation with the Maltese courts? And more part and in particular, can they still proceed with the filing of urgent applications, with ship arrests, with flag injunctions and similar me uh, measures, which require a sense of urgency? Uh, the bottom line is that notwithstanding the fact that the courts have been closed, we could still proceed with the filing of ship arrests and other urgent matters. Um, in essence, the only thing that was different was a procedural change, whereby um, apart from a claimant having to file his act, the arrest, um, he would also simultaneously need to file, he simultaneously needed to file a application requesting um, court be opened with urgency. Now, essentially, this procedure is not new to us lawyers and practitioners because it is the same procedure which we already um, effectively follow whenever we have to arrest a vessel outside of normal hours. So whenever we arrest a ship in the middle of the night, this is the procedure we have to follow anyway. Um, there was another development a month, a month ago on the 4th of May, whereby the, court, the government issued another legal notice and where, wherein it maintained the closure of the Mortis courts, it allowed for the reopening of the court registry in a very limited um, manner, whereby only legal procurators were given access to go and file documents.
for uh, those foreigners who are attending this webinar, under the Maltese procedural system, the legal procurator, that person who physically attends court and files the judicial act. Um, obviously, since the court, the court registry was reopened, we no longer needed to file any application to open court. And therefore, as of the 4th of May, we could file any act in court without any issue. We could file uh, applications that relate to urgent matters, such as ship arrests, and we can also we could also file um, actions on the merit. The only problem, though, was there were still two restrictions in place. And these restrictions were effectively that no court sittings were being held because court was still closed. And secondly, that all time frames and time bars was still, were still suspended. Um, in essence, and by way of example, uh, with a ship arrest, that meant whilst you could file the ship arrest, uh, the 20-day the, the uh, period within which a claimant has to then file his action on the merits was suspended, which meant that uh, the claimant really was given more time to negotiate with the debtor before opening up his action. Um, on the other hand, there was nothing to stop hit the claimant or an arresting party from actually filing the action on the merits. However, no hearing would be was being appointed because the courts were still closed. And to be, to be perfectly frank, I had intended to use this webinar to explain the effects of these two measures on the different maritime claims and procedures that we have available under our law. However, earlier this week, the government made further announcements whereby there were more developments in this regard. And as of today, the 5th of June, court has been reopened. So today, for the first time in two and a half months, there were uh, civil and commercial sittings. Um, as you can appreciate, the, there have been there are administrative measures whereby obviously court is now subject to the standard um, social distancing uh, measures. And, and more importantly, the chief justice and the members of the court registry have implemented a series of uh, restrictions in terms of how the proceedings are going to take place. Uh, we already anticipate from now that the actual usage of court will be at its at 50% of its capacity. In other words, only half the halls will actually be used. Now, uh, this we can already tell from now there's going to be a backlog of work. Uh, we have been hearing to the grapevines that the um, members of the judiciary are pushing for the court summer recess to be shortened so that uh, some of this backlog could be, you know, um, shortened and they can make up for, for the lost time. Um, it's also anticipated that the actual parties will not be allowed to attend sittings and it will only be their respective lawyers who will be able to attend. Uh, we have been informed that every sitting will now be given a specific allocated time um, whereby the, the, the lawyers can actually attend the sitting. And, it is only at that particular time will they be actually allowed in court. So again, this is to, to measures in, introduced to, in relation to social distancing and whatnot. Uh, one major drawback that has been anticipated relates to the actual access to files. So usually during a court sitting, the lawyers have access to the court process. You can see what has been filed and you can refresh one's memory in terms of the judicial acts in the court file. Um, as of today, lawyers will not be granted access to the file. Uh, whilst obviously this is inconvenient, it is not really an issue because in any event, uh, generally lawyers take their own files with them and would have their own copies of the Judicial Act with them. Um, another setback that we are aware of is that the members of the judiciary are adjourning cases that involve uh, viva voce or oral testimony of witnesses. Therefore, if in a case there is evidence that needs to be heard orally, uh, the judges are not scheduling them and they are moving them for a later date uh, towards October or November of this year. Again, this is a setback, but it's not, it can be overcome. Um, if the respective lawyers agree between them, it makes perfect sense to agree to produce any evidence that the parties may have by means of affidavits. So rather than having to go to the hassle of 
waiting another six months to have the hearings for viva voce evidence, it makes perfect sense for the parties to file their evidence by affidavit. And in that case, the hearings can continue. Um, another important uh, development as of today is that apart from the reopening of courts, all time bars that have been previously suspended um, are being, sorry, there's been a lifting of the, of the suspension of all time bars um, in Malta. In other words, as of today, the time bars and prescriptive periods are no longer suspended and parties and claimants are given a seven day grace period within which to regularize their position. In other words, any claimant or any individual who has been affected by a suspended time bar has until next Friday the 12th to file his judicial act or action um, or else will lose or risk um, the claim falling outside of the parameters of, of, of the law and therefore being time barred. Um, it's important on this point that we make a distinction between those acts that were filed before today and those cases where the actual time bar would have otherwise expired before today. In other words, by using, an, again, ship arrest as an example, um, if the arrest was filed, let's say, one month ago, and therefore the 20-day period to file the action on the merits expired during that period when time frames were suspended, um, in that case, the claimant now has seven days, so that is until next Friday, to actually file his action. However, if the arrest was filed, let's say, two weeks ago, and the 20-day time frame is still running, in that case, the claimant has to file his action on the merits within the original 20-day period prescribed by law. Um, another important, I, I think I should mention another development, and now this is quite a sector-specific development in terms of banker claims. Um, the government announced as well that it is easing, as Alison has already explained, easing a lot of the, the measures in relation to port restrictions. And one of these uh, restrictions that has been lifted is to allow now, is that now, sorry, marine surveyors are allowed to attend um, ships within Maltese territorial waters. Um, within the context of bunker claim disputes, uh, this is quite an important development. Now, bunker claims are essentially either disputes in terms of quantity or disputes in terms of quality. Insofar as disputes of quality of the fuel supply is concerned, um, the matter is resolved relatively easy. In other words, they, there's a system whereby samples are taken on board both the bunker barge and the receiving vessel. Uh, if there's a dispute, these samples are sent to a lab on shore for testing. The results are usually definitive, and, and I mean, it's a scientific result. When there is a dispute on the quantity of fuel supplied, the parties have a bigger problem in that they need to send an impartial surveyor on board to take readings and to effectively see actually how much uh, bunkers were supplied. Now, until recently, this caused, there was a situation where by the parties found themselves having to rely on commercial sense to try to find an understanding. Um, thankfully, the situation now has changed and marine surveyors will, are being allowed again on board vessels. So this is good news for bunker suppliers. Um, from my end, I think that, that is so far the information we have, and, and, and obviously it has, it has, things are changing from day to day, and we hope that uh, the situation in terms of litigation uh, will continue on, the, on, on a good note, and, and hopefully the backlog will not, will not stay there for too much longer. Thank you, Adrian. So we have 10 more minutes, so we'll be taking questions. So we will first tackle the questions received by email. And if we have any further time, we will tackle those received in the chat. Speakers, I'll remind you that these are quick fire questions. You only have about two minutes each to respond. So the first question will be for Anne. And you've discussed the challenges faced by ship owners in the middle of, in caught in the middle of the migration crisis in the Mediterranean. Of course, this is a hugely complex issue. Um, what do you think can be done to address these challenges? 
Well, thank you for giving me two minutes to answer. <laughs> a question that has taken over 20 years. And, uh, clearly, um, Martin, what, what cannot continue is that um, there is this expectation, this moral obligation to save life at sea, which, as I said, um, I know of no crew member, I know of no master who disregard that because it, it goes to the very essence of seafaring that um, you do save life at sea. So, so there you have the, the ships, the masters, the crew who are saving life at sea. But that, that, that saving of life at sea cannot subsist on its own. There has to be the corresponding obligation of states to disembark these poor souls, to relieve them because these people have been at sea for, for, for many days in horrific circumstances and to relieve the crew. Now, I think that this is a problem which is, which is totally under the radar. Um, I do not believe that um, enough is being um, said out there. Our case, the Maria was covered by Lloyd's List, by Tradewinds and a number of other um, uh, shipping journals, but there has to be uh, an international maritime platform where this matter, where the dilemma, and where the, no, it's not actually a dilemma, where the challenges which are faced by ship owners and crew are, are discussed. Of course, this is a problem which goes way beyond shipping. This is a problem which produces geopolitical challenges. It is a problem of um, bordering on humanitarian law. But I really believe that uh, the shipping community, through the respective organizations, you know, the IMO, the International Association of, of, of Ship Owners, they need to be at that table. They need to be at the discussion table where decisions are taken as to what is going to happen, as to how to solve the problem. Um, I also believe that the ITF have a very important role here. And I think that once the ITF, of course, have their hands full and they do an excellent job in dealing with the problems of individual seafarers as they arise, this is a problem which is dealing, which is, which is um, affecting a whole load of seafarers. You do not want a single crew member being faced with a scenario where he is one of another 12 or 13, like we had on the Maria, who have to take care of 79 people who have just gone through that kind of trauma. Seafarers are not trained to be humanitarian first aiders. So I think the ITF needs to step up to the plate and really uh, take charge, if necessary, of this situation. Thank you. The next question is for Laura. So given that the registry must have been working remotely over the last few months, has this affected the efficiency of the flag with respect to timing of registration of transactions in general, and maybe more specifically in relation to the registration of mortgages where the timing is crucial for lenders? Well, the simple answer to that question would be no, not really. And the okay. reason for that is that um, as some of you listening might have uh, already experienced with Transport Malta, when a transaction is about to take place, any documentation which is required by the registry is filed in advance. And the reason for this is to ensure that the documentation is pre-cleared and approved so that on the day there are no delays, precisely for one of the reasons being, as you said, in the case of mortgages, no delays can be afforded. So with documentation pre-cleared in advance, we can ensure that once instructions are, are received, uh, the registration can take place within practically a matter of minutes. In fact, we refer to it as practically simultaneous registrations. Um, uh, Transport Malta are, are always on standby. When they know that a registration is coming up, they're always available. Um, and they proceed with release of certificates as soon as possible. The only slight delays we have seen relate to transcripts of register. And the reason for this is that um, uh, with us not being able to carry out searches physically at the registry, everyone had to resort to applying for transcripts of register instead. So there was an increase in demand and uh, those certificates usually take a few days to be released. But other than that, uh, we haven't really seen any delays or a decrease in transactions being, being carried out. Uh, as I mentioned from today, staff is back to working normally, so we expect things to return to normal gradually very soon. 
Okay, thank you, Laura. So the next question is for you, Alison. Um, you've been asked, how long do import importation procedures for commercial yachts normally take to be affected? Okay, um, I like the word normally because now we're, we're all speaking about the new normal, you know. <laughs> so uh, it will be interesting to see how that's going to be applied in various uh, facets of our life. But it's, it's the first question that clients usually ask, sort of how long do we have to, or captains more, more often, who are planning the, the schedule of the yacht. So how long do I need to stay there? Um, uh, Normally, um, the importation process, even before the introduction of the um, uh, more uh, efficient procedures, which I described earlier, would take, if we are extremely um, lucky and everything moves as smoothly as possible and there are no unforeseen circumstances, only a few days. So, or to, or erring on the side of caution, we always advise clients to factor in five to seven working days, just of course to cater for those parts of the procedures where we have no direct control, where, it's, where something that was not foreseen might, might, might occur. Um, however, of course, now that we are awaiting guidance from the authorities on, on the new measures to be applied, therefore, of course, we need to um, cater for any additional time that may be required to, to abide by those requirements. However, from experience in handling these importations, I can say that the authorities are extremely reactive, extremely efficient. Um, the, the whole process has been tuned to a fine art. So I, I am very, very hopeful that uh, even if there are additional um, steps that we need to follow, um, these will be integrated very smoothly in the current procedures where you already use online submission of forms, where the customs department um, and the valuation department where necessary usually provide an appointment within a matter of, of days, if not hours. So uh, I, I believe that it will not take uh, much more time than we usually had to follow. A lot as well depends on how quickly the client sends us the documents we need in advance, because we can move very quickly once we already have copies of the registration certificates, the valuation reports. Once those have been pre-cleared with customs, sometimes even while the office is still um, underway, um, then it means that once the office is physically birthed, we can really speed through um, uh, the, the requirements because all the ducks have been placed in a row even before. So, so yeah, so, so hopefully it will, it will not change much, but of course we need to, you know, all work together on this. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, um, we received quite an interesting question for you that I think I can link up with your presentation. Um, as a result of the debt holiday payments, borrowers have been required to enter into amendment mortgages or second priority mortgages. When would you need to enter into one over the other and what is the reason for this if one exists? Okay, so it, it largely depends upon the, the reason for which we are entering into this uh, fresh security. So if we are talking about an increase in the amount being secured, then we would generally opt for an amendment mortgage because the, the obligation is being terminated at the same time. While when uh, we're talking about underlying obligations, two different obligations, that are being secured and they have a, a maturity date that is different, then we would opt for a first priority mortgage and a second priority mortgage so that on fulfillment of one obligation, we would simply terminate the first priority mortgage or the second priority mortgage as the case may be. And in that manner, um, we don't have to uh, register fresh security by deleting both at the same time in the case of an amendment mortgage. Thank you. The last question I think we'll be able to take because we are running a bit short on time. Um, Adrian, you spoke about court proceedings and judicial proceedings and timeframes. Um, what about arbitration proceedings in Malta? Were they affected? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, the short answer is no. Um, unlike court, arbitration proceedings were not affected by any, any legal notice. 
In fact, the Arbitration Malta Arbitration Center continued to have hearings. I had to attend two this week myself. Um, and it was business as usual. I also do know that some tribunals proceeded having the hearings virtually. Obviously, they have that flexibility which court does not presently have. Um, but the short answer is no, it was business as usual. Okay. So that's, I suppose that's it. Thank you very, very much for joining us. And I hope that you found this webinar useful. Um, we are aware that there are a number of questions that were sent in through the question and answer box that we did not manage to get to in time. However, we'll contact you directly by email to reply. Um, if anyone has any follow up questions they would like to ask, I have put an email address you can contact us on in the chat box. So please feel free to do so. And someone will get back to you. Thank you very much for joining us. And it was a pleasure having you today. Thank you very much.